I'm very much honored to introduce Eric Brynjolfsson. Eric Brun I met Eric Brynjolfsson in January um, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and he was there, and people said, and I think it's, uh, it's not a rumor, but it's uh, actually a fact, that his book, the second machine age and his theories about what is um, coming and what's not coming influenced the topic of this World Economic Forum quite heavily and um, also pushed um, Mr. Schwab into, um, into holding a forum on the question of industry, um, or the fourth industrial revolution. Eric Brynjolfsson is now able to um, to speak to us live um, from Boston. <laughs> Eric, hello. So Eric can't see us yet. He will see us when we have the, when we have the um, questions later. And I have two mics here because with one mic he's hearing me and with the other mic you're he hearing me. Eric uh, studied at Harvard and he is um, holding now a professorship at uh, MIT. He has done a lot of research in, in all kinds of areas of um, artificial intelligence and you probably all know his book, The Second Machine Age. You also know one of his st former students, Albert Wenger, who spoke already this morning. So I think there's no need to introduce um, any more details about uh, Eric Brynjolfsson. Eric, I'm so happy that you're here, and now the floor is yours. We're all um, happy to have you here, at least virtually, and hear what you, um, what you have to say about the second machine age. Thank you so much, Armin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Armin. Uh, it's a it's, uh, it's a wonderful conference that you have organized, and I regret that I can't be there in person. Uh, fortunately, the technology is evolving rapidly, and uh, I hope you can all hear and see me. And I want to share with you some of the research we've been doing at MIT and some of the work I did in my book, The Second Machine Age, with Andy McAfee. Today, I want to talk about some of the big changes that are happening in the economy. Uh, I believe a technology surge is underway, one in which the promises of science fiction are quickly becoming realities. You know, cars and trucks are driving themselves, and not just on closed courses, but in normal traffic. Machines are learning to understand our speech, figure out what we want, and satisfy our requests. They can write simple text and generate new scientific hypotheses that end up being su supported by later scientific research. They can compose music and beat us literally at our own games, like poker and go and chess. If you show the next slide here, you'll see a chart of the progress in chess. The little blue line there shows that humans are getting better each year at chess, but the red line shows that machines are getting, much, getting better much, much faster. And this is not just true in games like chess, but it's true in many other areas. And I'm convinced that this surge is just getting started and there's much more to come. You know, if you show the next slide, you can see that the number of robots is growing rapidly. Um, and the rise of these machines is a function of two very fundamental forces. For one thing, all of the necessary building blocks for the second machine age are continuing to proliferate rapidly. The costs of processing, memory, bandwidth, sensors, storage, etc., are all falling at an exponential rate. Cloud computing is making these resources available across the world. Big data is getting bigger and letting us run experiments and test theories at an ever greater scale. And billions of humans around the world are being digitally connected. And they're not only tapping into some of the best educational resources, but they're also contributing to them and remixing them and extending them. This means that the global population of innovators and entrepreneurs and geeks is growing quickly. And with it, the potential for ever more breakthroughs. The second reason that I believe the surge is only in its early stages is more fundamental. And that is that we have recently figured out how to build machines that can figure out things on their own. They can learn on their own. The reason you're hearing so much about machine learning and deep learning in the press is that these technologies are responsible for human and even superhuman levels of performance in a new wave of applications from recognizing street signs, 
and parsing human speech to identifying credit fraud and learning to diagnose cancer. They work essentially by studying lots and lots of examples and looking at them over and over, finding the relevant patterns, and then applying what they see to new examples. So what does this mean for the economy? Well, there's a paradox. Despite the amazing technology progress that we have seen and that we will see going forward, middle class incomes are stagnating. The median income, that is the income at the middle, the 50th percentile, and those below in the United States and other advanced uh, countries in Europe and Japan and elsewhere, is actually lower now than it was 20 years ago. And even life expectancy is falling for working class American whites. So how can this be? It seems like a paradox. Well, if you go to the next slide, slide number four, I would argue that digital progress does make the economic pie bigger, but if you click ahead, uh, you'll see that there's no economic law that everybody or even most people will automatically benefit. It's possible for technological progress to be biased in a way that makes the pie bigger, but some people are made worse off. Now, 100 years ago, there were only a very small group of people who were made worse off. But today, the number of people who aren't participating is half, 80%, even 90% or more of the population. And that's a big change. In fact, I can show this to you graphically on the next slide. Andy McAfee and I call this the great decoupling. Uh, this is data from the United States, but it's similar in other countries. What you see in the blue line is that productivity, or output per hour worked, is at a record high. However, median family income is lower than it was 20 years ago. These two used to be tightly joined. You see, for most of the 20th century, they, they tracked each other. But recently, they have become decoupled, and the average person is not participating in this enormous growth. Instead, almost all the gains are going to the very, very top, the 1%, and even the 1% of the 1%, the rich and the super rich the kind of people that uh, Armin and I got to uh, hang around with a little bit there in Davos uh, earlier this year. Um, so people are getting upset. Um, in, in Europe, you see upheaval. Uh, yesterday, Donald Trump uh, won uh, in Indiana and is now likely to be the nominee of a major political party, the Republican Party. On the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders, uh, he also promised to upend the economic and political system. He also won the primaries last night. In yeah. primary, he's doing much better of the many people have when they see that their incomes aren't keeping up and that they're even falling behind. So what should we do? Well, let's go to the next slide, and you'll see that I think it's time for a new grand challenge. Uh, if you click ahead, you'll let's click all the way to the end of this slide. Um, you'll see that digital technologies will continue to accelerate, but our skills and organizations and our institutions are lagging behind. There's a gap between what the technologists are doing and what managers, economists, policymakers are doing. Uh, it's harder for us to adapt to these technologies. If we don't make changes though, this decoupling will get bigger and bigger. So we need to reinvent our organizations. We need to reinvent our institutions. We need to reinvent the way we skill and, and, and educate our people. And if we do that, I believe we can uh, address this grand challenge just as the technologists have invented more powerful robots and machines that can play chess and diagnose cancer, we need to reinvent a new economic system. In the end, I don't think the technology is going to decide who's rich or who's poor or whether or not median incomes are rising or falling. In the end, it's us who will decide. And in the end, that will depend not on our technology, but on our values. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions now. Thank you so much, Eric, for that great talk. And of course, I, we have now quite a lot of questions. I start with the first question. Could the universal basic income be one of these institutions that you um, want to see in the future to um, make sure that this pie is not in the hands of only a few? 
Well, it's a great question, Armin, and I've enjoyed very much talking about this with you and many others. It's a very hot topic, and, and I'm glad that uh, it's be going to be on the agenda in Switzerland and, and increasingly in many other countries. I would say that in the long term, we have to have a basic income. At some point, the robots are going to be so effective that they'll provide uh, plentiful food, clothing, shelter, and great abundance. And I think that's a very optimistic world. So I think when I look ahead, I don't know whether it's 50 years or maybe sooner, um, I think there will be a widespread use of the basic income. But as you and I have discussed, I'm not convinced that it's the right answer today in 2016. And why am I not convinced that it's the right answer today, even if I think it's the right answer in the future? Well, uh, we still aren't in a world where there's such great abundance that we can easily pay for uh, everybody's needs without people working. And perhaps more fundamentally, um, Voltaire had a great insight. He said that work saves us from three great evils, boredom, vice, and need. And basic income addresses one of those. It addresses the need, and that's very important. But work does more than just provide economic uh, income. It also gives a meaning to people's lives and keeps people engaged in their community. And over the past couple of hundred years, it's really become the central way that people become connected. Research from Bob Putnam and others suggests that when you take away work and you simply give people money, um, people aren't very happy, and often it becomes very dysfunctional. So I think we need a transition plan, and I think it will take decades or more to get people to transition and feel more comfortable with a new society which is lighter on work. We need to focus on education, on wage subsidies, and other ways of encouraging work. And so I can see a transition pass, but, but I'm not quite sure it's right yet. That said, let me just close your question by saying that should you vote for the basic income coming up, I, I would not oppose that. I think it's important to do these kinds of experiments because so we don't really know exactly how people are going to react. You would, and, uh, you would I think vote it would be yes? Great to do a test. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, it, you have to make your own judgments about that. I think uh, if, it would if, be If you were a Swiss citizen, how would you, what yeah. would you vote? It's a good question. You know, I think I probably would vote yes because I'd like to see the experiment run. I'm not sure it would work. But we won't know unless we try, and uh, I, would be, I would be very interested to see the, uh, the experiment run, and, and if it needs adjustment, we can make adjustments later. Okay. What, are there further other questions? We still have time for some questions. So, there are one question. I have to give you both mics. Very short. Okay, yeah, very short. Um, so my question is, do we all have to become geeks if you aren't already, or are there any kinds of jobs that are safe from technological disruption? We definitely do not all have to become geeks. I, I think it's great to be geeks. I admire geeks, and I like hanging around with them. Um, but um, there are many other ways of being successful in the new economy. Robots are not good at, at creative works. Um, they're not good at interpersonal skills. They're not good at coaching teaching, caring for children, um, persuading people, selling. So I think there are many jobs going forward that involve uh, not necessarily geeky skills, but uh, emotional connections and interpersonal skills. Uh, it's going to be tricky to know exactly which jobs will be growing and which will be shrinking, and I fear that we won't do that transition smoothly, but I am confident that it's not just geeks, it's a broader set of, of skills that will be needed going forward. So there's another question. Eric, what do you think, how long will it turn that normal companies we see nowadays will have a total shift? How long will it take until the company... I, I don't think I heard the first part of the question. Say that again. He said, how long will it take until companies um, that we see today will like um, shifting towards something completely new? Well, I think the sad reality is that many of the companies we see today are not going to shift and they're going to go out of business. And we are seeing more and more big companies failing because it's very difficult to make this digital transition. It doesn't come naturally. It involves a new way of decision making using data. And what often happens is that it's the young new companies that take over many of these industries. 
There have been some companies who have made this transition. Uh, I was just meeting with the top executives at General Electric, GE, and they're very aggressive trying to make this change. But I think it's harder for a bigger company that's been successful with the old ways to abandon the old ways and make the transition. Um, this is something that's an ongoing change that's going to take uh, 10 or 20 years at least, just as the earlier revolutions in, with steam power and electricity took, uh, took decades. Um, and it's it, in the process, inevitably, uh, many of the old companies end up failing because of it's so because it's so difficult to make that transition. Okay, uh, one last question, perhaps from Rick Watsman. Very short. Great. Eric, can you describe what this transition looks like between now and 50 years out, when there is enough abundance that work as we think of it now is no more? What's the transition look yeah. like? I have to be honest and say that it's very difficult to see the transition. It's one of those ironic situations where it's e almost easier to see the distance than what's up close. In the distance, when the robots are doing most of the work, I think a, 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 it'll, it, it could be what I sometimes call a digital Athens, where we can focus on, uh, on poetry and, and uh, games and, and sports and, and uh, interpersonal things. And the machines will take care of our basic needs. But between now and then, I think it's going to be very disruptive. We may have uh, people like, uh, like Donald Trump and others uh, demagoguing about people who aren't participating. I could see revolution. I could see violence. Um, I could see the failure of a lot of big companies. Um, our current system is not adapted. Both our economic system and our political system is not adapted to this new world at all. And we need to get out in front of it. I, uh, I fear that uh, if we're not aggressive about understanding this disruption, uh, it's going to be very painful. Some of the previous adjustments were also painful, and this is a, a bigger adjustment than we maybe have ever seen in human history. Um, I would come back to what I said earlier, that the technologists are doing an amazing job of advancing the technology, but economists like me and managers and policymakers are failing badly at understanding the transition, and this is an area that requires a lot more research. Uh, experiments like basic income are a good idea. But um, if we don't get in front of it, I'm, uh, I'm very worried that the disruption will be, uh, will be very difficult and, and even violent. Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and answering questions. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric's thoughts can also be read in his book. So um, if, you, if you have other questions in the book, probably you will also find quite a lot of other answers. Eric, thank you so much, and greetings to Boston. Thank you, Armin. It's been a real pleasure. And a great applause for him.